Uh, so without further ado, um, uh, Neil Cohn will be presenting uh, his research on visual language grammar. And uh, I guess, Neil, you can introduce a little bit of your background. And okay. Uh, well, the, the research that I'm giving, uh, presenting on, um, I've been working on for about seven years or so, in and out of academia, um, always with kind of a foot in, uh, getting advice and guidance from people. Um, I have a very bizarre background, I guess I could say. Uh, I, uh, uh, amongst other things, am a professional comic book artist, uh, at which I started when I was about 14, working for a company. and. Uh, then I went to college and started taking some linguistics courses. Uh, my actual major was studying Japan and Buddhism, uh, but the, I started making connections with things, things in the, the linguistics literature and things that I was finding in comics. Uh, and I use scare quotes because that will be more clear in a little bit. Um, and so this is what that is a connection of. Um, and uh, I, I don't need to give you a bio, I think. so. Because uh, that'd just be boring. Um, so I, I have a feeling uh, a lot of people have said that there's very different meanings for the term visual language, and I also have a very different meaning for the term visual language. Uh, and I'm going to be making that clear what I mean. So I'm distinguishing it by saying a natural visual language for one, uh, and uh, much the way that we discussed about sign language is the first, you know, many years of sign language research were attempting to prove that it was a language. I would say that. You'll see that also in my talk right now, is that I'm trying to prove that something is a language to you. Um, and uh, you'll probably also notice that I have a maybe iconoclastic view on several issues that are involved here. Uh, so I invite you to hopefully enter with an open mind and then uh, give me vehement feedback. And we can hopefully go further with something interesting from there. So uh, I'd like to just start off by um, uh, giving you several sequences here. And I'd just like you to think to yourself for a minute of, uh, of just the way these sequences read to you. And I'll point out that anything that looks like this kind of style uh, of drawing is stuff that I drew. Uh, things that aren't in that general style of things that I did not draw. So uh, I didn't feel the need to put citations everywhere for all of my graphic sources. So just bear that in mind. So uh, hopefully linger on a couple of these maybe, think it over for yourself, and now moving on. So first I'd like to make maybe what is perhaps a somewhat simplistic and hopefully obvious statement is that human beings have only three modalities that we can express our concepts in. We can use an, our auditory modality for, to make, create sounds. We can use our hands and faces. Here I cut my head off just for the sake of vanity. Um, and uh, uh, facial expressions and, and hand motions. And we can create images, uh, largely through drawing or, or things graphically, graphic creation. So uh, now, words are extremely powerful and uh, convey a lot of information. But individual words pale in comparison to the power of a sequence of words. Now, at the same time, images are also extremely powerful, but they convey information in a very different way than words do. But still, individual images also pale in comparison to images in sequence. So not all sequences, though, read smoothly. Some sequences you read, and it just doesn't work right, while others read very smoothly and make a lot of sense. What this implies is that there's something going on beneath the surface of these images. There's some sort of system at work that distinguishes what are good and what are bad. So from here, I'd like to make a maybe more radical claim, which is to say that each of these three modalities yields a different type of language. The auditory form, when structured and given a grammar, a, this system of sequentiality yields a spoken language. When the manual form takes on a grammar, it becomes a sign language. And when the visual graphic modality takes on a grammar in sequence, it literally becomes a visual language. So this is what I mean by visual language. Um, so with, you have then 
a visual language and a verbal written language that unites in a socio-cultural context of comics. So comics are essentially the sociocultural artifact in which this visual language is used. You can use the analogy that uh, English is to novels what visual language is to comics. Uh, and comics are also a subculture and community that have grown up around this. And you could essentially call this community the visual language group. They're the speakers of this visual language. They're the ones who carry this. Uh, so while comics is a sociocultural artifact, the visual language is a biological and cognitive ability in contrast to this sociological artifact that we associate with it. Uh, granted, there are, of course, bleeds back and forth as with any sort of language system. So this might make you mean, well, what do I mean by language then? So what I mean by language is that, first off, uh, you'll see a lot of peanuts strips because I'm currently a study using peanut strips as a corpus. So I have a whole bunch of them in here. Um, so what I mean by language is, first, that it is a system that, in which concepts are conveyed through a modality of expression. In this case, the modality is the graphic, the visual graphic modality. Uh, and we have concepts such as uh, a boy here, we have Charlie Brown, we have uh, more symbolic items such as these stars that indicate pain, we have lines that indicate motion, and bubbles that indicate speech, right? And these are all elements of meaning that are conveying concepts through this graphic form. I also mean that a language is a system that conveys concepts sequentially through a rule-bound grammar. In this case, the sequence is fairly apparent, and since I'm going to be talking about what the grammar is quite a lot, I'm not going to belabor that point right now. Um, this is also a system that is culturally relative in diverse populations. So uh, American comics we use what I would call American visual language, of which there are many sub of this. Uh, indie comics use a different graphic dialect than superhero comics. And these are both different than Japanese comics. Uh, and both of these are very different from the Australian sand narratives that Australian Aborigines use. They draw narratives in the sand. They're having a uh, very complex sequentiality that's temporal and not visually sequential, as uh, would be mimicking a print industry. They draw in the sand in real-time interactions. Um, and uh, there's a couple different sources I can talk about in relation to this later. So all of these were es essentially different visual languages in a very literal sense. Um, in addition, this system is used by a community of people. Uh, and in the case of this visual language, this community is comics fans who gather at giant conventions such as Comic-Con because that's a place where they can actually interact with each other uh, on their own terms in, as a community. This system is also uh, gives an identity to these people in this culture to varying degrees of severity. Um, so the, the socio-cultural aspects of language are very important. If you're going to say that something is a language, you have to say that, well, it, people embody this notion. And perhaps even more so, this system is acquired naturally by children without imposed learning. And they do so in this learning across a developmental trajectory. Uh, whether you want to say there's a critical period or not, that's a debatable point. But children have to be able to learn this with no imposition. They can't be explicitly taught it. They just do it. They pick it up naturally without thinking about it. And uh, I'd like to show this example. This is a, a drawing a, uh, of a Japanese visual language by a Japanese seven-year-old drew this uh, and gave it to me. Uh, this is far more proficient, I would add, than... American 13-year-olds draw. Um, and uh, this, again, goes to the fact that there's this trajectory of development based on exposure. Um, so additionally, through this research, I started noticing, as I started out in this, that uh, we have, our, in our culture, assumptions that are made about graphic communication in general that are the exact opposite of the way we think about language. So I call this the art perspective versus the language perspective. And you can think about these as different types of paradigms of thought. So in the art perspective, everybody is encouraged to draw individually and be innovative in their drawing styles. Everybody should draw to their own suited needs, and everybody does this. The language perspective, everybody has to be exactly the same. Everybody has to be using a, a similar system that is mutually intelligible. Everybody has their own systems in their head, but it has to be mutually uh, in, uh, mutually comprehensible by others in order for it to form the system. 
Uh, imitation in art is bad. Don't copy other artists, right? Imitation in language is central to learning. The art perspective, through the iconicity of images, you think, well, it's just the way that we understand perception. It, the perception alone is just about vision. We understand images because it's involved with vision. The language perspective would say, no, that there's actually the, this photological structures or photemic structures, which are patterned ways of graphic, uh, uh, graph, ways of organizing graphic information, that you have structures in your head that allow this understanding to take place. And it might be linked up with the knowledge involved with, with vision, but it is unto itself its own structure. Uh, the art perspective would say that in, because of this iconicity, every, images are universal and uh, not relative. The language perspective says that there's diversity that requires a degree of fluency. The art perspective says that drawing is an innate talent or skill. Language perspective says that you only have this innate potential that becomes realized through exposure and practice. Uh, to a system external. Otherwise, the way we have it right now, if you're familiar with home sign, essentially all drawings are very like home sign. It's everybody makes up their own system as they go along and then hopes that it links up with something else, somebody else's. Uh, and it, this somewhat works. It's really dim. Uh, hope we, can you all see this well enough? Okay. Um, so, uh, oh, we need light for the, the interpreters. Um, so as a whole, you can think about this in terms of that we don't think about graphic communication as involving a system at work there. You can say that people speak and create sounds. The system that that uses is language. People draw and create images. We have no comparable comparison to that. We only say that we, talk, we have categories for what we call that, comics, art, sociocultural artifacts. But we don't identify that there's a system at work there in graphic communication in general. So, Moving on then to the actual visual language grammar, almost, because before you can talk about things in sequence, you might want to talk about things individually. So the main unit, I would say, is a panel, which is just a demarcated space that has stuff in it, right? And a panel has in it active elements and passive elements. The active elements are the things that move across panels, things that do things, that passive elements are the things that don't. Usually this aligns with foreground, background distinctions, but it doesn't have to. Here, the active elements are the uh, sun setting, and the ascetic is just uh, additional semantic information. It might not necessarily be grammatical information in terms of the grammatical structures, but it's definitely semantic information. Um, so using this distinction, you can then categorize different types of panels based on how many uh, active entities they have. So what I call a macro has a full scene or multiple active entities in it. A mono then has just one entity shown in it. A micro has less than one entity in it. A polymorphic panel has a complete action th shown through repeating a single entity in it multiple times at multiple states throughout an action. And an amorphic panel has no active entities whatsoever, often just environmental information. So uh, this can be a little bit tricky. So this is a sequence from a book called Northwest Passage, where a bunch of mercenaries are chasing after a Native American chief. So in this panel, is very clearly a mono because it only has one active entity in it. It's just the chief. Here we have a macro of the chief who's really small and interacting with the mercenaries. But the first panel just has the mercenaries, which I would say is a mono because they work collectively as an entity. The, in semantic terms, it would be an unbounded group with internal structure. Uh, it works as a whole unit. So we can categorize this, and this is what I call the lexical representational matrix, or LRM, just to give an abbreviation to it. Uh, if you see along this side here, you have uh, a dissension of the amount of ent entities that are contained and what it contains, and then you have these altered through various types of framing devices, uh, image constancy issues, dividing one panel up into multiple panels, or, or an inclusionary or inset panel, which has a panel within a panel. Uh, now, I thought this would be interesting to use as a criteria for looking at whether cultures dis differ. So I took uh, 12 American comics and 12 Japanese comics. I coded 300 panels in each one. Um, so the, the degrees of uh, polymorphic panels and amorphic panels were ex uh, negligibles. So I'm just leaving them out here. Uh, 
American books had a lot of macros. They most often would show the whole scene at, at a time. Uh, they had uh, about you know, half as many monos and hardly any micros at all. In contrast, Japanese books use a far less amount of macros and almost an equal amount of monos to macros and much more micros. So if you take these two columns additively here, you can see that more than half the time Japanese books are using less than a full scene in their representations, which is somewhat striking and we'll return to that in a little bit. So moving on to the earliest approaches to this visual language grammar, uh, we're very intuitive. This is a gentleman named Scott McLeod. He's a comics author and theorist. He wrote a fantastic book called Understanding Comics, which spearheaded a lot of discussion about these sort of formalist things. It was, I obsessed with it as a teenager, which is how I started making these connections in the first place. And he very intuitively thought, you know, you can categorize the linear relationships between panels. And there have been similar approaches done by many people. But linear understanding doesn't work, and here's why. First of all, in this case, you have two macros next to each other conveying the information of a punch. But you can also convey the exact same information as that first macro through two monos. Additionally, you can have two panels here as the start of this child giving uh, a woman a, a flower, and you can capture this exact same information through just an inclusionary panel, which encapsulates this amount. So what this tells you is that you have to have some sort of grouping of these panels in order to move to the next panel, because you can accomplish that with just one. Uh, this would be complementary distribution in terms of ling linguistic study. Wait, are you saying they are the same? So the these two aren't, but the ones of the two panels in the first case compared to the one panel, uh -huh. those are the same in terms of information. They might draw different attentional structures. Psychologically, they may not be the same. Well, because they use different processes, and I'll get into that. But in terms of an attentional structure, they're very different. In one, you're highlighting things in a different way than the other. So in this terms, uh, panels serve to focus attention on something, not to necessarily distinguish the moments in time, per se. So uh, this is largely a difference in broader perspective. The transitional approach just looks at one unit in relationship to its immediate constituents, whereas this other approach takes in that sequences mean something as a whole, and then try to identify the parts therein. So this is another good example of this. Here, you know that this action in these panels here take place within this house. There's nothing in those panels that tells you it takes place in the house. You only know this because the first panel is put next to them. But the first panel does that through kind of a broader scope. You know that both panels involve that not just the first one. It acts over the whole se sequence. So this is further, furthered by broader distance problems. So here, this first panel has to be able to connect with this panel because it's the same person. Assumably, this is a, a, a micro showing this. So you could say, well, it's a, maybe it's a different person. But for the sake of argument, accept that it's the same person. Uh, they have to connect somehow. Just like this panel here of a clock definitely has to connect to this panel of a clock. So what I actually found analyzing this, uh, and this was a sequence that I drew for an artsy project long before. I didn't create this for this purpose, but it worked really well, is that this is actually structurally ambiguous. So one interpretation of it has two different time frames embedded within each other, that these connections involve two different temporal connections. The other one combines those panels into a common environment for only one temporal change. So this is actually shows that there is structural ambiguity beyond the surface of just the sequential images. Again, showing that there's something more going on here than just this linear sequence. And this happened in linguistics, too. Uh, it used in the uh, pre-1950s. They used to capture this with this kind of state diagram, which, uh, as you progressed along the diagram, you got these kind of optional routes that you could take, right? Uh, for many, this is probably very familiar. But again, this has trouble with distance problems, because you can say the student and the brilliant student and the and student have to still connect with each other. You can also say the brilliant bored student, the brilliant bored redheaded student, and the brilliant bored redheaded sleeping student. And it gets even worse when you say something like, the teacher who wished his brilliant bored redheaded sleeping student would wake up and pay attention shouted his lecture. So somehow these units have to be able to connect with each other. And so despite you have 
a linear sequence, really what you have is these broader hierarchical connections. And this is, of course, what Noam Chomsky brought to the table in the 50s. And uh, he also said that pieces could move around and whatnot. Um, I won't even bother with that. I don't necessarily agree with it at all anymore. Uh, but this is what he brought to the table. And his model looked like this. He said that you have this lexicon uh, of units that united with syntactic principles, syntactic formation principles, and entered into syntactic structures, which then outputted into the phonological structures and the semantic structures. So in this model, syn syntax is doing everything here. Uh, now, uh, there is an alternative viewpoint uh, proposed by a student of Chomsky's, uh, Ray Jackendoff, who says that not only does syntax have these formation principles, but uh, phonology and semantics also have these formation principles. And it doesn't just run out of syntax, each of them mutually interface with each other. And this interface creates the lexicon. So lexical items are distributed throughout these structures. So since we already had a discussion of cognitive grammar, to let you know where cognitive grammar fits into this, cognitive, and this is what Jack Enough calls the parallel architecture. Cognitive grammar essentially gets syntactic structures altogether and says that syntactic structures are derived from just the phonological and the semantic principles. Um, for my work, I like to take a middle ground. And uh, I'd also add, in doing so, it's the exact inverse of ch what Chomsky proposed. Um, I like a parallel architecture for many reasons. I studied Buddhism. I like a middle ground approach. Uh, and for full disclosure, I'm actually uh, Jack and Doff's graduate student. So uh, have like I have to like it. But I liked it before working with him, so that worked out well. Um, so uh, Jack and Doff, I will, Jack and Doff's model also includes, I will say, a spatial structures as well, which encapsulates things such as image schematic information, which uh, cognitive grammar does so far more elaborately and in depth. But they're mutually, they're, they are compatible systems. Uh, to alter this to work for visual language, uh, really what you need to do is say, get rid of phonological principles and say that they're photological principles because it's visual and not auditory. Uh, for the sake of argument, because most people associate syntax with nouns and verbs, let's call the syntactic principles of the visual grammar narrative principles or narrative structures. And s semantic principles are largely the same in terms of both uh, conceptual structures, uh, propositional concepts, and in terms of event structures, which I'll go into a little bit later. Um, and you can then create a broader view of all these connections with each other. And when you have, I, of course, uh, this is incredibly incomplete as an architecture, uh, but lexicons then get distributed throughout this. So verbal expression gets distributed between this realm here. Of course, if you bring this into writing, you have to include photological structures as well because they encapsulate another interface for graphic, graphic communication. The visual structures then would encapsulate this structure largely. Um, but notice that there are links between them and encapsulate different types of expressions, uh, which I won't really go into that much. Um, so moving on to actual visual language grammar, if we return to McLeod's original transitions, you can see that really there's more going on here than what his minute linear relationships. For instance, on this side, all of these first panels set up some sort of event which I call an initial. Uh, on this side, the event occurs, which I call a germinant. It's the flowering of the predication, you could say, of the event. Uh, and all of this can be encapsulated in a visual sentence. And don't bear too much in mind with the term sentence in this case. Uh, just think about it as terms of a, like a maximal node for these things. Uh, I'm in the midst of a terminology shift anyways, but I left it all because it was easier to make the slides this way. But be aware that the terms are probably going to be changing very soon. Um, so here, you can easily see the initials. Uh, I figured I needed to balance out the more violent demonstrations with something more sweet. Um, so before an initial, there's often a place that establishes the interaction without acting upon it, what I call an establisher. Or afterwards, there's a coda or a release of the tension of this interaction, which I call a disillusion. Um, altogether, you can combine these structures together. And it works even when you have text. But of course, introducing a lot more text 
uh, has more drastic influences. I won't be talking about multimodality so much today, but I do have thoughts about that. Um, and for now, I'm going to use this formalism of constituency structure, also something that might be changing based on how my research goes. Um, so between an initial and a germinate, you also have this structure here, which is kind of a medial structure, which I call a relation. And this is often just encapsulates a path information of some state in between the start and ends. Uh, it isn't always that case, and it's not the case that all paths, mi middle points of paths, are relations. But there is this kind of uh, broader prototypicality to it. Um, so in addition to this, beyond the level of this kind of sentence structure, you have often panels that give place information, like that house earlier, which I call an orienter. And they're not just place information. I'll go into that in a little bit. But it's kind of a superordinate structure above these things. So if you look here, not all place information is always an orienter either. So in the first example, again, it is an orienter that you move inside that house to see what's happening for it. It's the superordinate structure there. In the second example, it's an establisher because it sets up what's going to happen in the initial and the germinate. And at the bottom here, we see that it is the initial for the germinate state to then have the flowering of the interaction because it's actively involved in that. So it really depends upon the sequence for you to identify what these things are. Uh, furthermore, it doesn't have to be place information at all. Here, the orienter is a dog uh, for fleas on its back, right? Uh, it's not a place information. It's just uh, it becomes that orienter information. So you can also embed these sentences within other sentences. Here, the first interaction sets up the second interaction, right? And notice here, if you're familiar with uh, semantic coercion, that you never actually see uh, Snoopy getting the ball here. You just know it happens in this case. It's uh, through inference. And here, you can argue a sort of type shifting occurs. Um, so again, returning to this hierarchy and knowing that you can combine two panels into one panel and things like that, uh, you can see that environmental information can be distributed within a single category here you have two establishers that show different aspects of the scene. Again, there's this attentional structure, which I call e-conjunction, or environmental conjunction. Um, you can also see it here, where you have numerous ninja jumping in three uh, panels. They all are conveying the same type of functional information. Here you have a split in both the establisher and the initial before they come together in the germinate. You also have modifiers. In this case, what I call refiners. The middle panels here both just serve to modify or hone in on information that's in the previous panel. And they then become part of this kind of initial phrase or initial phase. Uh, and the assignment uh, travels down that hierarchy. So the head is whatever is higher on this hierarchy for being refined. Uh, here we have two refiners following, wow, uh, okay, uh, two refiners following the first establisher. It's just giving you more focal information on that original unit. So if you remember, Japanese panels used less macros than American ones. Well, what this implies, at least in the case of the micros, is that Japanese books might be using refiners a lot more. And if you look at mi micros and monos together, they might be using a lot more e-conjunction. And this is similar to other claims that have been made about Japanese, that they sit, don't uh, progress in actions as much as American comics. And this gives that same interpretation. So uh, there's also uh, another type of spatial modifier, which I call perspective. Now here, the zoom is the refiner here. And you also have this perspective of just giving an altered viewpoint. They're not very common, which is why this is a, the only really good example I have, which is really small, and I apologize for that. Uh, I'm actively looking for better examples of this. But it is something that's out there. It's just not used very much. Um, you also, of course, can repeat categories. Here we have another one that has two establisher refiners in it. Uh, here we have three relations that are just showing the action of this character falling to the earth uh, repeatedly. And notice that you can get any of these. 
Uh, if you just like hold up your fingers, you can see that they delete without any problem because you have multiple ones. Uh, and here you have multiple initials that just show a variation on the same initial state before the germ occurs of the light going out here. So sequence, though, of course, does not equal grammar, uh, which is, again, very different from the art perspective. The art perspective say, well, anything goes. In the language perspective, you say, well, some things work and some things don't work. Um, and you have various examples of this. For instance, in this sequence, you have competing predicates. You can't have both of these panels acceptably for this sequence. It was pointed out for me, though, by a group of uh, comic, stu comic art students that if you were to turn this panel here into a thought bubble, it would work fine because then you provide two alternative pathways for the germinant to occur, right? Maybe this is the thought bubble for the pitcher or something like that, right? Then it, then, then it would work. And this is, of course, true in language two. You can't have two predicates, right? It just doesn't work unless it structurally allows for something like that, uh, such as the potentially coercive things like began the book uh, or began reading the book. There you have a verb that takes another verb. Uh, additionally, a sequence like this has no grammar at all. It just creates a semantic network uh, of things associated with summer. And this is similar to a verbal expression that's just a bunch of words that associate to a, a season, right? And you can tell this because you can easily rearrange these units with no general effect on the sequence. So you also have a sequence like this, which lacks both grammar and semantics. There's just nothing, this doesn't mean anything whatsoever. It's just garble, right? And this would just be throwing out a bunch of words. There's nothing unifying them, no semantics unifying them, no grammar unifying them. Uh, additionally, something like this uh, is grammatically well-formed, and it should feel all right, but semantically illogical. In this case, uh, you have a reversal of the thematic roles. The, what should be the agent-patient relationship is not reflected in the, uh, the the disillusion. And this is my direct copy of a Chomsky sentence, John killed Bill, so John is dead. It was so well formed, but it doesn't work. Uh, similarly, uh, Chomsky would point out that you can have grammatically well formed things that are semantically meaningless, such as his famous colorless green ideas sleep furiously, which I submit a sequence like this does ac accomplish this visually. And I've asked several comics readers about this, and they all give me the same that's really weird, and it kind of works, but it doesn't. And they get very disturbed by it. Um, and I also just constructed this one recently out of Peanuts uh, panels. This one should have that same feel. It should have this feel of this narrative structure to it, but it doesn't mean anything whatsoever. So it's cap off about panels. Panels are not moments. They are units of attention. Panels do not linearly divide gloms of time and space, but they do window conceptual information of spaces, environments, and events. They are not maximal units of narrative, because you can combine units to form higher environmental constructions. So before you ask me about film, uh, let me point out that what film seems to do is it first captures just a kind of pervasive temporality of seeing. Cameras just capture information. It just kind of goes. Uh, this is another graduate student at uh, Tufts uh, in our office, just walking around. So uh, film just kind of goes, right? That's the way perception works. You just kind of see things, you take it in. But you also have these cognitive structures of this visual grammar, this narrative structure. And together, they form a hybrid to create something that unifies both of these elements of the temporality of seeing and these cognitive structures. And in doing so, the temporality of seeing, of perception, might bypass some of these cognitive structures that would otherwise be very distinct in the graphic form. So, why doesn't visual grammar look like verbal grammar then? Why do I have these very different structures that aren't nouns and verbs whatsoever, right? We usually associate grammar to nouns and verbs. Why does it look the same? Well, to answer that, first I have to give a mini lesson on semiotics. Uh, 
which is, of course, the study of signs, here taken directly from Charles Sanders' purse, as opposed to Saussurian uh, semiology. Um, purse said that there is a sign vehicle, which is some sort of sensory information out in the world. It's just this sensory stuff, right? Uh, this would then connect to some sort of referent, which he called the object. Um, and then mentally, this would connect to an interpretant, which was the mental aspect of this. Um, now, the Saussurian sign, just for edification's sake, the Saussurian sign is ambiguous as to whether it talks about the object, the referent, or the referent in the mind. It left this completely ambiguous. Uh, and because of this, everything is arbitrary to the Saussurian sign. And because of that, it's just limited to seeing everything as arbitrary, when that really isn't the case. Uh, additionally, the interpreter interacts then with the interface between the sign vehicle and the object. Uh, which Peirce called the ground. So you can't actually connect the interpretant to the referent itself. That's impossible. Uh, otherwise, it would be the referent, right? So you can only connect it to this interface. And he categorized these. As uh, Dr. Wilcox eloquently talked about iconicity, icons get their meaning through resemblance or similarity. All of these are iconic for a face. But notice that they vary to the degrees of their conventionality. The sign vehicle carries whether or not it's conventional, its systematicity. In contrast, indexes get their meaning through causality or through indication. A finger pointing doesn't mean what it's ref ref referring to, right? It's just a finger, the actual referent is something out there that it's pointing to. Uh, just like a footprint gives you its meaning by telling you what was once there. It's causative. Symbols get their meaning by, for purse by a reductive definition that is neither indicative or causality or resemblance. It's the only thing that's possible that's left is through common agreement, conventionality. And we have these in many different forms throughout uh, culture. Now, to go even further, I'd like to make maybe a somewhat more radical claim, which is that the different modalities that we have, these three different modalities, take to these different types of semiotic expression uh, in different ways. And each one kind of prefers one type of dominant expression. They're all capable of all of them, but they dominantly are better at one thing or another. The auditory form is superb at symbols. The manual form is excellent at indexicality and in locating things in space. And the visual form is really, really good with icons. Uh, I'm going to talk primarily just about auditory and visual graphic things because we have people who are far more knowledgeable than me about the manual form, and I don't want to step on their toes. I would love to hear their thoughts in relationship to what I'm about to pre present also and uh, share some ideas that I have, but I don't want to overstep my bounds, as it were. Uh, so as I agree with Jack and Off about events also is that the language faculty seems like it may have evolved for the capacity to express conceptual structures. Syntax evolved so that it could express concepts, so that it could express events. Uh, I'm going to here use Jack and Off's very recent model of event structure um, that's coming out in a book that I think, I don't even know if it is out yet, but it, it's out very soon. Uh, language, consciousness, and something, something, something. I don't know the rest of the title. I'm a terrible student. Um, but there's other very similar approaches to this, such as Ptolemy's event phases and many other things. I prefer Jackanoff just because I'm working on it right now. So, um, but Jackanoff would say that you start off with a preparation that forms an event that can form another preparation for an e even larger event that then falls out in a, in a coda of that event, right? If you're going to shake hands, you're preparing, you extend, you shake, you withdraw, right? That's the event structure. This should look very familiar because it's very, very similar to these narrative structures. In fact, there's a very clean isomorphism to kind of prototypicality to these structures. This isomorphism doesn't happen with, visual, with verbal grammar. You have to be able to convey these event structures, phrases and clauses and sentences. Nouns and verbs don't have this direct isomorphism to event structure. It may be the case that the narrative structure interacts with these, these structures from uh, verbal language as a form of narrative or discourse structure. This is one of the ways that we are 
aiming with research a little bit, but I can't say you know, definitively, yes, this happens, because I have no real evidence, uh, except for uh, some papers by Martin and Gernsbacher that show that uh, common brain areas are using both in uh, sequential images, narrative structures, and verbal, but she doesn't necessarily have the structures themselves, so I'll leave it at that. Now, for these purposes, what might be even more interesting is that you could say that through this isomorphism, the actual categories of this visual grammar are iconic to event structures, where the categories in verbal expression are symbolic, they're arbitrary to the actual event structures. So, to go even further, you can say that there might, should be some sort of relationship between the lexicon and the grammar in this way. So, symbolic lexical items give you a symbolic grammar. An iconic lexical item gives you an iconic grammar. Now, extended even further to talk about the modalities of expression, you see that the verbal form, which is very good at symbolic expression, takes its, its symbolic expression and uses a symbolic grammar. The visual form takes its visual and iconic information to turn it into an iconic grammar. So, something like this then is flouting this a little bit. Something like this, which if you don't know what this is, this is a Dunkin' Donuts ad. I don't know if you guys have Dunkin' Donuts here or not, but we have them everywhere in the Northeast where I am currently in, and in Chicago where I previously was. And it's essentially just mapping the uh, verbal grammar onto visual forms, right? And that's why they, they struggle with things like, you know, what do you do with a preposition? You know, what do you do with that? Or, what, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, you know, okay, sure, you can show maybe the store or something. Notice, that, that is why I love this sequence in particular. Uh, this is a symbolic grammar mapped onto visual stuff too, right? This sequence is great because it also serves uh, to show what could potentially be a visual grammar also. Here, right, this could be an orienter in America, right? There was a guy who started running, you got through your initial, and then it just falls apart when you get to the symbolic items, right? It could, you could see, interpret this through the two different grammars. So what this is doing is it takes the graphic modality and then says that there's both icon iconic items, which are very natural for it, and not so natural symbolic items. And then uses the symbolic grammar following that. Does that make sense? So this would be what I call an artificial or a borrowed grammar taking the grammar from some other form and imposing it on the system, right? So an artificial or borrowed grammar is something like this, or something like Bliss Symbolics, which was hypothesized as a universal writing system, right? A universal system, which I don't think is possible. Uh, because any universal system, one, has to deal with things like polymorphic morphology and things like that, which would be very difficult. And in all cases, it has to mimic whatever language it's being used with. It has to mimic that grammar. Uh, it's always, always borrowing a grammar. So you can use very overt, you know, non-overtly narrative items as your visual lexical items. This is from a, a web comic by a friend of mine named Tim Godek. Um, uh, I think his website is, uh, I don't even know. But you can ask me if, you're, if you really like it. But notice, here he uses just a sun and a moon as orienters. Very just overt things, right? He also uses books very overtly. Here's this object, or internet solitaire very overtly, as refiners. Here's this thing going on in there. Doesn't necessarily have to show a close up of a person holding it, just gives you the object. And he even goes so far as to metonymically use a germinate by showing just an off light bulb, right? This off light bulb is rep representing that he's turning off the light bulb. You don't see a hand moving it or something like that. He's just giving you the information. But it's all within this visual grammar. So, what then is a natural visual language grammar to contrast from an artificial one? It's a grammar that emerges from the structure of its lexicon. It's a grammar that comes out of it, motivated out of the actual signs themselves. It's a grammar that shows malleability for cultural diversity in various communities of speakers. And it's a grammar that is acquired by children through exposure and imitation alone. Nobody has to teach those kids how to draw sequences. They just do it because they read comics and they draw. That's all. Uh, so, what does this approach give you? This approach gives you a way to characterize the nature of signs and their relations to event structures and conceptual structures.
gives you a visual grammar that is motivated from the structure of its lexicon, not artificially created for a non-natural system. Non-natural. It gives you an embodied view of both the lexicon and the grammar because they're linked up to certain modalities. Those modalities can also use any type of semiotic expression. Verbal expression uses icons and indexes. Manual expression very heavily because it's also visual uses icon iconicity as we've already seen very well demonstrated. Uh, but it gives you a sense that these are embodied together. All these structures are linked in specific ways because that's the most natural way to do it. And it points towards a holistic view of a mental architecture and its interconnections, uh, which Chomsky's grammar certainly does not. It says the syntax is this separate thing over here, and everything else is different and uh, not interconnected. So to conclude, I'd like to say that instead of seeking to construct a grammar for visual language based on properties of verbal symbolic language, uh, proverbially forcing the visual grammar to jump through the hoops of the verbal grammar, we should instead acknowledge that a natural visual language already exists with properties unique to its own modality. And this modality and these properties have existed throughout all of human history. Nobody is coming up and nobody invented this visual language. It just happened through evolution uh, and it happens in different ways through different periods of time throughout human history. And we should explore the relationship of this structure to those other modalities. And that's it. Thank you very much. Yes. I have a question. Um, in, your, in your presentation, do you sign and symbol equally? Uh, so do you ever differentiate? I yes, I use them very specifically in the Persian sense, in that a sign is any sort of sign, not no arbitrariness. A sign is any sort of sign vehicle. It's some sensory information out in the world that means something to somebody. Right? The arbitrariness is only a symbol. So symbols are only things that are arbitrary. Signs can be icons, indexes, or symbols. Oh, and icons, indexes, and symbols also can be conventional in addition to being sign. Type of sign. Does that make sense? Does that distinction yeah, make sense? I always thought that he was talking about, you know, uh, sign as a sign value to something and symbol as an inherent meaning. No, no, not so much. And symbols, icons, and indexes are also, for purse at least, not things, right? They are only the relationship of how that thing gets its meaning. It's that interface, right? Okay. Do you have any other question? Yes. So you've described the science of defining this area. And so once you describe, well, for me, the science, the, the structure of it, and how to think about it, how to study it, then the rest, the, what it, the rest of the community is that you, how can you use it? And so I'm really curious about how you would use it. You know, the graphic novel environment is, it, from my point of view, I get, and I'm going to ask you for concurrence or, or actually argument, is that you try to get across maybe an emotional sentence in pictures and an emotional story in pictures, which not, we're not very good at in drawing yet. We're getting better and better. Do you think studying that in a way that you're, you're parsing out the world makes it so that we can, in the next version of a graphic novel, be even better at communicating some line well, of thought? Partially. So, did you want to address something towards I'm just going to give a, a, oh. clean, a clean use that I saw yesterday on the plane, which Please is the, the emergency procedures when you're in the, uh, the, the exit row, right? It, it's, there's no words at all. No, there's not. It's, comple right. it's completely... Right. Uh, also note that that dialect is very unusual and seems, as a graphic dialect, it seems sort of off sometimes. And one of the things I'll point out is that the reason why, maybe, is because if you look at this next time you're on a plane, which for many of us is like a couple days from now, that the arrows go ahead of the end, right? So if you have like a hand moving, instead of it creating a trail for the path that has already been traversed, it would go here and then have this arrow to kind of try to give an instructive future tense to it. Yeah, I, I and it just be, doesn't work I at all. Be, you're supposed right? to do that. Right, it's like, this is what you should do. But it doesn't work because it's a path, right? That path encapsulates two event structures at once. You can't have a future event structure that is easily conveyed. If you have it here and you have the line, right, it's much cleaner that way. Or you um, jazz it up, right? Or, yeah, right, yeah, right. right. Have it like this, then have one of those Japanese micro hand traveling through space. Exactly, that polymorphism, <laughs> right? Oh, okay. I say. So, so part of, partially then, uh, I would say that uh, there's multiple things. One, I'm... Just like any language, I don't think what people are doing in linguistics is going to make people speak a lot better. 
Uh, so you, you might not get like better graphic novels out of this. You might get tools for which people can t discuss it. For instance, having visual grammar parts of speech, as it were, might enable people to edit better <laughs> things graphically because then they could speak about, well, you need this here and here. But they probably already do that. But you might get, get better instructional panels or if I want to convey unambiguously right. chemical information to you. Right. Yes. Exactly. And the other thing I'll say is that very rarely are you just getting this just visually, right? Most of the time it's multimodal. You get text and the image interacting at once. Uh, and again, you have that come back to that kind of art perspective. This, if it's used as a language, is unconstrained in usage. Art is used very specific cultural context, right? Graphic novels, you know, entertainment, things like that. Language, we use language for everything. Language is used in all sorts of different contexts. Why not use visual language in all sorts of different contexts, right? And just think about it in terms of communication in that terms. Uh, my last graphic book was nonfiction, and it was about the pervasive influence of corporate, mega corporations on American democracy, okay? That isn't necessarily, you know, I didn't try to make the pictures, I didn't try to make them, you know, uh, evoke this emotional response per se. I was working with someone else who did most of the text, but I was graphically translating, you could say, adding a, an additional language to it. But I just wanted to be communicative, right? And that should be the intention, is communication, uh, as I think we're all here to participate with. The other thing I would say is that I already have had some ideas uh, on how, as I said, you, you want to use a system that's natural, that's not kind of borrowed from something else. And this natural system is more narrative in nature. And if you're going to do that, you can't use a fixed system of signs, per se, that uh, are imposed on a structure, right? That are going to be borrowing all their meanings. You want to use signs that are motivated and use them in a, a manner that's motivated as well. So, you want to give people essentially the ability to draw, right? And one of the things that the sand narratives do is that it's real-time interactions. By virtue of ecology, our visual language in our culture just happens to be a print culture. It happens to be something that is drawn, these forms it takes a long time to draw because it's highly iconic, realistic drawing oftentimes. It takes you a long time. It's bound to a publishing venture. At most, you could maybe have a quicker version of this through, say, internet publication, which you draw it and then you post it online, or you draw it for somebody, right? But I think it would be somewhat ridiculous to ask people to carry around pens and paper and to draw comics for each other when talking. It'd just take too much time, right? The, the Australian narratives, what they use is they just have it in the sand. Sand is abundant because they live in a desert, right? And they just reach down and they, they sit on the ground. Most of their life is on the ground as it is. And they actually have a concurrent uh, gesture sign language, uh, a sand narratives, and a verbalization. And they use all three at once, all together at the same time. And the great thing about the sand is that it inf instead of having it be unitized sequentially this way, it's temporally sequential, the way that our speech is temporally sequential. It just unfurls and has different properties to it. And what I think you could do very easily is just to have some sort of panel that people could carry that have a display. I mean, I have in my bag, in case you wanted me to draw things, my pen pad. And you just have something that people can draw that's attached like their finger to draw on a keypad or something. And you don't have to have it linearly unitized if you have some sort of, of uh, system that's established that you can carry out it temporally in space. Right? And I have, I, just through the earlier panels, I was like drawing and sketching different things out. And I can elaborate on that more if you like it. At some point, I don't necessarily have to be standing up here doing that. Um, so, uh, how am I doing on time? Um, our next speaker starts in five minutes, so. Okay. We just have to have a little transition. Okay. So, if anybody has any more questions. Oh, can I just end on one? Oh, yeah. Did you want to? Yeah, I, I just, um, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Well, one thing that I um, visually remembered was your comparison with the Japanese and American comics. Right. Panel categories. Panel categories that are prevalent in each. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering if, if you believe or you think uh, that using this sort of uh, analysis to categorize a different language is be useful in language translation. Possibly. Uh, the reason I ask <laughs> I don't know. But 
friend that I have worked with, we were messing around with Babelfish. Okay. Just the, the online yeah. translation. Yeah. And we typed in uh, no soup for you when we went from English to Korean. Okay. And we grabbed the Korean and put it back into English, and we got something completely different. Right. So I'm wondering if it would be an interesting sort of. I don't know, sort Possibly, because you it could. could be yeah, it might be, because you could say that, well, I mean, as I. See, I do believe that the conceptual structures for all these modalities are shared. Like, it's not like you have, you know, one set of conceptual structures for one modality and one for the other. You share them. You might have different aspects of those conceptual structures coming out. Uh, 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 David McNeil would say that you have uh, a growth point, uh, which is the concept, right? And that, that you tap into different aspects of that concept for your gestural displays and your visual displays the gestural may be more iconic or something like that, right? So you could say then that to tap into some sort of visual structure to then interface the different verbal structures too. So that way it's not you're translating, you know, this verbal structure into this verbal structure. Is that you're translating this into this visual structure and then using the visual structure to get the, the other verbal structure. But you'd probably be more adapted to that than I would. So I, I don't know, give it a try. Why not? You know, it'll just take, you know, some time and money and then you'll see if it works. Right? So, so thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I liked it a lot. You know, exactly. oh, thank you. That's really thank good very much. What's my we didn't, we didn't so yeah, we just, no, I just used your name. And we seem to be into a transition period, so I'll wait till people are, are, have had their break. I'm sorry? I'm like sure. totally parched. Okay, so um, this is a talk, on the, the conference is on visual and iconic languages, and so I thought I'd put this picture up here, because most people when they have kids and they're photographers that take pictures of their kids, I don't have any kids. So we steal kids that we see in, the, in restaurants. So this is just a little girl who sat next to us in a food court. Before you think anything creepy of me, my wife was with me. And I gave a, picture, a copy of the picture to her parents. So, um, and one, I'm just proud of the picture, so I thought I'd show it. But also, I think it conveys a lot of information about her mood. Just real simply, mostly I'm just proud of the picture. So. All right. I'm going to take a pretty different tact than most folks here. Um, so the work I'm going to show you is based as an extension of my thesis research, which I did at Penn, uh, where I developed an annotation scheme for gesture. And this was trying to, well, and this was a, one of the first usage of, uses of this scheme. But I want to be clear about what we annotated, and that's the subtitle. Just a little reduction might be good for your soul. So what do I mean by that? I'm not going to get into the word soul. It's the reduction part that I find interesting. Um, the, class, the, the classic notion of, or the most common notion of gesture given by Kendon and McNeil would be that we have a few types of gestures, a few generic gestures. There's beats, there's iconics, there's uh, metaphorics, and there's dykesis. I'm pretty cool on the dykesis. I think all of us agree that I'm pointing to something when I do this. With my eyes, there are cultures that point with their lips. We, we get that stuff pretty easily. Um, icons are pretty easy, too. What am I trying to say? T talking on the phone, right? But metaphorics um, are really odd, and too many things are a beat for, uh, in my opinion, for the McNeils and the Kennans of the world. Um, but in particular, it doesn't tell us enough information. Icon tells me a lot, but I'm fascinated by the things that aren't easily um, categorized into icons or metaphors, right? If you were sitting there, are you the timekeeper? Right. So if you start doing this, this is a metaphor for me to hurry up. Why is it a metaphor? Well, because my speaking time and the time of my presentation gets metaphorically mapped to the speed of this rolling along, right? So those kinds of things are, are clearer, and they look like good things to grab. However, there's law, and, and cross-culturally, we have to be really cautious when we send folks to Iraq to not do this in certain, certain circumstances, to not show the soles of your feet. I mean, there's all kinds of gestural information that's really important there. But we can codify that. And we have good theories to codify it. We have bad computer science so far to extract it automatically. But we have good theories, right? So I'll give you a, just a personal example. My wife is Thai. And um, we were driving in Thailand. I was driving in Thailand hard because it's, it's the opposite drive. It's, it's British-type 
drive. And we're driving along, and there was a, um, a traffic cop who went like this. Okay. Now, what does this mean, do you think? It means come closer. To me, it meant slow down. Yeah. Right. I, so I stopped, because he kept doing it more emphatically. <laughs> so I stopped, and we got a ticket. Because in, Thai, in, in, in Thailand, this is how you call things. This is how you tell. So, it was, so that's clear. The distinction's easy. We could build a model of that. But I'm standing here doing things like this. Um, there was varying degree of gestures here. What I find interesting is that. What does this add to the conversation? Right? When I do this, um, what does it add to the conversation? Even that shrug, well, that was what? So those are pretty easy, but there's a lot that are hard to codify. So what we did at form, with form, let me see what this says, um, was to, to decide that these gesture units, I, I, I don't defi define the word gesture, I'm not talking about the slide yet. <laughs> I don't define the word gesture. Uh, that was more to remind me what I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't define the word gesture, um, but we have these things that are gestures. There are beats, there are icons, there are metaphors. And those are like words. They're kind of a word level. Maybe not. Maybe they're sentence levels. But we also have things slightly beneath them. Like a beat is made up of a preparation stroke and a retraction. Right? Similar to the event shapes that uh, Jack Neff talks about. Those are kind of like a phonology. But preparations and strokes and retractions are made up of movements of the arms and the body and the head. And those are kind of like a phonetics, kind of like an articulatory phonetics. And beneath that, we have the physics of the mouth mapping to the physics of the actual movement. So my interest is what I call a kinetic level. Right? And this kinetic level is, I mean it to be analogous to, because it's, it's not firmly analogous, the, na the na analogy down in lots of ways, but I mean it to be analogous to articulatory phonetics. I'm that's the study of the way the mouth would move to produce sounds. I'm interested in the way the arms move, or the, in, in, in my research it was the arms, it's really the whole body, but how the arms move to produce these sequences of phrases, excuse me, sequences of phases of a gesture which create a gesture like a beat. Why would I want to do that? So why annotate at the kinetic level? Well, because some beats might have more emphasis than others. Some beats may have anger involved in them or emotional content where other ones don't. If we just call it a beat or if we just call it a stroke and we don't know anything about acceleration or uh, the third derivative is jerk um, or velocity, then we can't argue that, th we can't say that that beat had more content than some other beat or more emotional content, for example. So does everybody get the idea of why I wanted to do it at this low level? That's a real question. That wasn't a, that wasn't a, <laughs> I, st I want. Can you, can you just define just for the group your preparation stroke and or what you mean, the, the space is in your. Yeah, I think I do in a little bit, but so actually let me get to the, uh, let, I will get to that. I don't want to rush you on. No, it's I okay. I get to that there, so I'll do that in a second. So let me tell you my ultimate goal. I, I believe this is everybody's ultimate goal here, and I mean this picture to be able to be morphed into everybody's ultimate goal, so it's a cheat. Okay, but so um, person A has some content in their head. I'm being completely agnostic about what that content is or how it's represented. I'm cheating a little bit, so something propositional. Person B, in the end of a communicative interaction, is going to get an approximation of that content into their head. These are all fuzzy terms. I'm not defining them. Um, head is not defined in any uh, technical term. The only thing I did do technically here is that there's a caret over the content for person B to mean an estimation. It's the classic probabilistic notion of an estimation of a probability distribution. We convey that information via sentences, context. By that, I mean the context is available to us. It's both sentential context, dialogue context, um, and, and, and situational context. Um, but after, actually, these conversations, I realize that arrow is bad because it doesn't flow. And then it, it's, it's just there, so I'm going to have to change how I put context, maybe a blob around the two. Uh, we send intonation, we send facial expression, we send gesture, we send etc. But a, a, a fast, my holy grail goal is to figure out how all of those contribute to the content and how all of them interact with one another. Of course, I'll be dead before that happens, right? But here's the classic example. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Right? I meant that to be sarcastic. So it shows that I'm not happy to be here at all, right? Where that intonation completely negates the proposition given by the sentence, I'm happy to be here, right? That's the kind of interaction I'm interested in. 
ideally on a broad scale. Of course, for this work, we just looked at some gesture stuff. And we didn't get very far at interacting with other stuff. All right, so let, let me explain the, uh, the notion of a reduction. I mean the notion of reduction analogously to the way uh, biology reduces to chemistry and chemistry reduces to physics. Right? And why only a little reduction? Well, let's say we want to know, uh, so chemistry allows us to answer questions that neither physics nor biology, uh, that neither physics nor biology can. Right? Chemistry allows us to ask, how does the Krebs cycle work? Or what proteins bond to a cell? Right? Biology can tell us the usefulness of the Krebs cycle. Chemistry tells us what's actually going on in the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is, is taking ADP, turning it into ADP, and giving you energy. I might have gotten that wrong. It's been a long time. <laughs> Other way around. ADP to ATP? ATP to ADP. ATP, that's what I meant to say. Right. Because you, you get another one. You get a phosphate off, which is the energy. I had to memorize that at some point in my life. Um, but if we gave a totally physics base of this, it would be useful inf useless information to us. If I just told you about electrons, that's not going to give us much information. Right? Um, a, more, a more germane example would be facts. Does anybody know Ekman's, everybody, does, does everybody know Ekman's work? No, OK, so uh, Ekman and his grad students spent many years learning how to control individually the facial, their facial articulators. So they could create, uh, I won't call them expressions, and this may be apocryphal, I don't know, but they could create odd facial morphings because they would use their muscles in ways that weren't part of normal facial expressions so that they could do studies of, of different facial expressions. And they needed a way to code facial expressions. Here was the, one of their fundamental questions. We all know a fake smile from a real smile, right? Not all, but I mean, we, there's, we know we, we, can, we can do some psychological tests where people, to enough percentage, can say that's a fake smile or that's a real smile. But we didn't, they didn't have a coding, um, a coding scheme that would capture the lower level information that said why this, this was fake and why this one was real. The encoding scheme was too coarse. Okay? Right? So facts allowed them to encode slight movements in their facial articulators, and they called them microexpressions, which allowed them to take a psychologically agreed upon fake smile, set of fake smiles and psychologically agreed upon, here I mean empirically, usually with undergraduates, agreed upon non-fake smiles and analyze them with facts and notice, notice differences across the facial expression. So that's the idea. We have a facial expression. If we reduce it to physics, that's not going to give us enough information. If we reduce it to a middle level, in this case very much maps to phonetics, then we can gather more information. So that, that's why I chose to um, annotate at this, at this level. I can tell my example didn't go well with you. I was just telling you what facts said. That's not, uh, I, I, I will be agnostic upon whether or not you can tell they're real from a fake. Right? But that's David Ekman's work. No, I know. It, it, I was just thinking. People See, can, I can tell the facial expression was one of, what, of doubt. People can make, people can deceive you. No, 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 right. Of course, people can be great at that. Right? That's what actors do. Right? But, but there are times we can say, that we would, on the whole, agree that that's a fake smile. And there wasn't an encoding scheme that could capture those differences. So fax was developed to be able to encode at such a low level. Right? And uh, the people who are really good at it are the people who can control those muscles well enough such that their intentions aren't getting in the way. Right? That's, that's the big issue. So um, I put forth this gesture coding hierarchy. Um, let's, let's start at the top with what I call the beat level. So this would be a, a David McNeil level. Right, where you have very high level, coarse grained um, um, categorization of a gesture. It's a beat, it's an icon, it's a metaphor, uh, it's a hold. Holds are pretty easy. And, and that gets broken down too. I'm, I'm giving caricatures of these. And, and, I, and I'm not doing that, I'm, not, I'm doing that for time, not for, uh, because I think it's bad work. Okay? Just beneath the beat level, I'm calling this, and this is, I coined this phrase, and, and this is not a phrase that's in the literature, PSR theory, preparation, stroke, and retraction theory. It's that, it says that, this is the answer to your question, Emily. It says that it's broken up to at least a preparation, a stroke, and a retraction. There are holds, there are pre-stroke holds, there are post-stroke holds. It's more complex than that. But the real the important part of it is, if I'm going to do this particular beat gesture, I've got to get my hand there, I've got to do the stroke, and I've got to pull it back. Right? So the gesture in PSR theory would be that there's a preparation, a stroke, and a retraction. And here's the key for this work. 
The key for this work is that stroke is supposed to be the cognitively salient part of the gesture. Right? It's supposed to map and, uh, well, it's supposed to map to uh, the, the most stress in prosody, the, 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 the syllable that has the most prosodic stress. It's supposed to map to other body motions. It's supposed to map to the important semantics. The stroke is supposed to map to these things. Right? So that, that, that's the theory. Now, and on the whole, that seems to be worked out. Um, Herb Clark has just done, done some really nice work that shows that pointing uh, have a very broad temporal, temporal range, and they don't really map to the, to the, at least in the context that he was doing the work in. I don't know if it's published yet, but the context he was doing the work in, it doesn't really map to the, uh, the prosody, right? or the most important part, or even the most important word. It, it was something like, we're supposed to go over there. Now, that's extreme, but it was that kind of thing. But let's assume for the point of this, for this point, that this research, for this research, that the theory says the stroke is the cognitively salient part, and it maps to the cognitively salient aspects of other modalities. Okay. Form is my annotation scheme, which I'm going to just leave that blank for now, because I'll, I'll show that to you in a bit. And at the bottom level, for physics, we're going to say it's motion capture. So is anybody not familiar with how motion capture works? Raise your hand if you're not familiar. Good. At least one person is there. There we go. Motion capture is designed to capture the actual motion of a person by putting sensors in lots of different places on, places on their body and putting them in a controlled environments so that those sensors can be read to a very fine degree. I mean, millimeters, correctness in the, in the range of plus or minus millimeters. Okay? And it's either done magnetically, so you have to stand in a box that has a magnetic field, or it's done with infrared reflectors. Right? And you have lots of troubles either way, but uh, who, is anybody, in Lord of the Rings, Gollum was done by motion capture. So the, there was an actual actor who made every movement that Gollum made, every single one. And he was in a blue screen box with the sensors all over his body, and he moved, and then they converted that to a frame for the animation, and then real artists came along. I make, correct me if I'm wrong, people who know this stuff. Real artists came along and then did the skin and the facial expression. Facial expression is still really hard. That's usually done by, um, by people. Okay? So the idea of our hierarchy is we can go all the way down to something like the physics. I'll repeat. The idea of our hierarchy is that we can go, to, go all the way down to something like the physics, or we can go all the way up to something like a sentence or a word, that the gesture was a beat. My argument was, this is the level we should use. Because this is going to tell us information that these won't, and this is too much information. Okay, so that's the overview of the talk. I'm telling you this now kind of out of order, because we have temporal constraints, and I'm going to skip a lot of slides that are in the paper. Okay? And p please feel free to interrupt with questions at any time. I'm talking very fast. I know that. Let me just quickly tell you what our, what our data structure was. So any good computer science talk has to tell you both the data structure and the algorithms. I'm going to skip the algorithms, but I'll start with the data structure. Okay? Our data structure is an annotation graph. Now, if the linguist in the room, you notice that I took this sentence and I morphed it, because the original sentence I couldn't stand. Right? The classic one was John hit Mary right, from a long time ago. And so I changed it to John consulted Mary. I thought it was far less violent and misogynist, misogynistic. So our no, an annotation graph is simply, for the computer scientists in the room, a directed acyclic graph. That's it. It's a directed acyclic graph. Where the nodes are timestamps, and the arcs are some linguistic, um, some linguistic event that happened in between those two timestamps. And you label the arc, arc with the event. So in this case, we say, from time t1 to t2, somebody uttered the word John. And then from T2 to T4, I know it's out of order. I know we skipped one. I did that on purpose. Someone uttered the word consulted. And from T4 to T5, someone uttered the word marry. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, because I'm interested in multimodal, multimodal expressions. And that means I say words that, ha that have some se sequential structure. And I move my arms that have a sequential, in a way that have a sequential structure. And I'd like to correlate those two, ideally. This allows us to do that, because I can also, well, I can add higher order stuff. I can say that a noun happened, and then a verb happened, and then a noun happened. And I can say a phrase happened, a noun phrase happened, and a verb phrase happened now. Right? It, doesn't, it, it can skip the verb phrase. I don't, have to, I don't have to mention T4. 
All I have to say is that a verb phrase was uttered from time two to time five. Right? I can add in that there was a particular dialogue act, a dialogue act that happened. And I can say that there was a gesture that began at time t3 and went all the way to t5. Okay? So this is, this is our underlying data structure. Our data is stored this way for the express purpose of being able to extend it with other modalities. Okay? So, uh, and annotation graphs weren't invented by me. This is a creation of uh, Liberman and Bird at the Linguistic Data Consortium. So, so here's what we annotated. The upper arm. For the location track, we gave you upper arm lift, relative elbow position along a circle created by upper arm lift, and then where, my, where the biceps, was point, biceps muscles were pointing. Were they pointing inward or outward, upward or downward, forward or backward? And we used all three of those, all three of those uh, dimensions. Right? So that gives me very close to, uh, it, it's not as good as motion capture, but it gives a pretty good description of where the arm is in space. Okay? Uh, for animators, they would actually just put a position here and then where the elbow is upon a circle. Um, we also had uh, whether or not the arm was occluded. We had an obscured, an obscured variable. Because if I were turned sideways, my human annotator could, could infer where my left arm was. But for scientific purposes, we wanted to be honest about the fact that the annotator didn't actually see it. Movement, upper, upper, again, we're only doing the upper arm at this point. We, we, we annotated whether there was movement in the X plane, the Y plane, or the Z plane. And I forget which is which, I'm sorry. But p take your <laughs> um, Whether there was an upper arm rotation, uh, whether there was arc-like movement or circular movement. Um, and then for repeated gestures, uh, we can ignore the, the effort. Uh, the effort, the effort uh, if anybody knows Laban movement analysis, the effort was an attempt to map it to Laban movement analysis. And in my opinion, uh, it either failed or is still future work. I think it didn't work so well. Um, and we used strokes because I might do this gesture. And instead of having my annotators actually do it for 100 times, they could just do the beginning and the end points and say that that same thing was repeated 100 times. So you, you see what I'm saying? This is, this is analogous to lip shape, tongue position, things like that. That's why I call it at a kinetic level, or a phonetic, uh, uh, analogous to phonetics. Oh, and now uh, for the forearm, we, did, uh, we defined the location by elbow flexion and forearm orientation. And there could be forearm rotation and elbow flexion. Uh, to, has anybody ever annotated linguistic data? Anybody in the room? Yeah. So you can guess how long this took. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll give you, uh, you, you have? Yeah. I had 11 Penn undergraduates working for me for about two years, and we have 22 minutes of Brian McWinning, te Brian McWinning teaching a class. It, it was a remarkably fine-grained. So I recommend one of the takeaways from this talk is don't do it so fine-grained, but let's use this fine-grained data to bootstrap to figure out what the next level up we can use is. So I, I, I did the pain for you, I hope. So. Or they did it. I actually, I didn't annotate a thing, I have to admit. So they did the pain. Um, we have in our system uh, torso orientation in three, uh, in three dimensions and head orientation in three dimensions, but none of the data we have yet has that. OK. Well, the, the above is nicely descriptive, um, but it collapses too many states into one. So there's actual, uh, there's ambiguity in the bicep. So let me show you why we did the forward-backward stuff. I mean, there's ambiguity there's all over the place because, I mean, there, there's, it's just, it's too coarse. Right? All, of the, all of these positions would get annotated exactly the same. So I'm, I'm being honest about the, the troubles we had. But what's the normal position of the biceps? Well, you might argue that it's, it's this, right? So if this were the normal position, then I could go, I could say that I could describe going up like this and out like this. And then this would be normal still. My biceps hadn't moved. I did a shoulder movement and a shoulder movement, and my biceps should be seen as normal. They're not rotated. Right? But I can also start here and do another shoulder movement and go like this. And my biceps should still be considered normal because they, they didn't rotate at all. My upper arm didn't rotate at all. Right? So the degrees of freedom are too great. I can get to there 
without moving my biceps, or I could get to there by rotating, my, having my biceps rotate. Right? So that's why we did this forward-backward, because you couldn't do it by degrees of rotation. Right? It's really hard, g given how much freedom your shoulder has, it's really hard to get a good annotation for this. Um, I already told you how it is, uh, how expensive it is. I'm sorry, I'm editing in my head to try to make the talk shorter, so give me just one second. Okay. So let me show you what the annotation process looks like by showing you a picture. Uh, well, I want to show you two pictures here. One, our work was based upon some earlier work by Adam Kendon. And this is, an, I believe he, I don't think he's published this, but this was his attempt at an annotation scheme for the gestural movements and how they correlate with words. Right? There's lots of problems with it. It's actually unambiguous, but it took us a long time of reading it to figure out that it is unambiguous. Um, it doesn't lend you, you can't read it off the page very well, but the most important po point from my perspective is we don't really know where the beginning of this gesture phase um, uh, maps to the words. Right? It's, 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 it's mapping an orthographic transcription to an orthographic transcription, so you don't get the temporal information. So how we did it, I think I have to go up. Oh, there's Brian. Um, do I do control L? Yeah, I can actually rotate. Just give me one second. Whoops. So this is, what, this is what our tool looks like. It's a tool called Anvil. Here's the video that we're annotating. Here's the number of seconds. These are divided into frames at 30 frames per second into the video. And this says that there was an upper, that there was an upper arm movement from here to here. So this maps directly to that annotation graph I showed you earlier. And this says that there was forearm movements of 0 to 45 degrees from here to here. And this says that, we, that the arm was here, then it was here for two frames, and then it was here. So we, we captured this, this, and this. Right? And then we described what happened in between. And you can see how difficult this was and why it took so long. Now, can anybody guess why we captured this, this, and this? Why the, we actually captured, well, I'll be, so, so for those of you who have just recently taken a calculus class, we actually captured this, 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 and this. Anybody know what those map to? It's, the, it's zero crossings in first and second derivative, right? So this is what the, the, these three were of this gesture were minima and maxima, and these two are points of inflection. Okay? Given those, we can use pretty common computer science tools to recreate the movement. So instead of having them annotate way too many places, we tried to have them intuit where the, where the zero crossings were and um, allow us to recreate it later. What's that? I have five minutes? Is that a real five minutes? Uh, okay, well then, let me tell you what I think, what, what we got. So what was the goal? Why did we build all this data and what were the experiments? Well, I wanted to take this data and see if it's the case that strokes are the cognitively salient aspect of the gesture, then there should be some mapping from the signal to the stroke. Uh, if you take all strokes and put them in a bin, they should have something in the signal that will allow us to call them strokes. Remember, I'm a computer scientist. I, I'm, a, I'm a computational linguist. I find linguistics fascinating, but if there's nothing in the signal, I'm not interested in it because cognition is not, brain, is not mind reading. It's got to be conveyed somehow, right? Um, so, to, but, but, so that's the goal, and I'll get to that in a minute, and I'm going to take slightly more than five. But, uh, but in order to, ask, to, to analyze whether our data was good enough, you have to ask whether the cognitive agents creating the data agreed. So classic annotation is inner annotator agreement studies. The fast answer of, is it, for the first excursion, they agreed on 80.6%, with 80.6%, which is OK, not great. But given how multidimensional it is, I'm pretty happy with that. that was for in, this was for inter-annotator agreement. This is intra-annotator agreement, which is the same person doing the same video two different times. 
right? So that person agreed with herself 93, to a degree of 93%. That was for one of the gesture excursions. For another gesture excursion, the inter-annotator agreements were still right around 80%, but the intra-annotator agreement was 79.4%. So fascinatingly, the same person doing the same annotation twice agreed less than two people doing the same annotation. Is fascinatingly a word? Again, 70 to 74. Offline, I can tell you about all of the ways that these other columns make the numbers better. And uh, 71 to 78. So it was OK. It wasn't the greatest, but it was OK. And given how high, high, high dimensional the space is, it, I think it's pretty good. Now here's the cognitively interesting part. The things that they agreed upon were things that we know are cognitively, cognitively uh, easy for us to figure out. So we define a gesture excursion as a rest position, a bunch of preparation strokes and retractions, which could be parsed into beats or whatever, back to another gest rest, rest position. So rest position to a rest position is a gesture excursion, which can get divided up, can get parsed. Right? Annotator A and annotator B are remarkably close at the start of excursion 1, the start of excursion 2, the start of excursion 3, the start of excursion 4, and with their endings. So we're very, very good at picking out the beginning and the end of a gesture excursion. Okay. We're very, very bad at doing things that computers are really good at, like assigning geometric degrees to it. Right? So this is our confusion matrix. We had 0 to 45 degrees, or approximately 45 degrees, or 45 to 90. Well, on that boundary, people are going to guess wrong or not going to agree. Right? So if you, if you look in the diagonal of the confusion, uh, confusion matrix, it's pretty good. But if you include the two minor diagonals, you capture most of the confusion. Right? So if we allow for a little bit of freedom for, that human beings aren't going to get degrees exactly right, our data looks a lot better. And I think we can build computational systems that can do this for us. Um, Oh, this is a very interesting one. If you do, this was an MIT, uh, I think it was Cassell's lab, but maybe it was after she left, um, study where they trying to pick out dictics or action gestures. That's the only two that they had. And then they had others and unknowns. And this confusion matrix says that we actually did better at the form level on the, on the diagonal than picking out whether or not something was a beat or a right. dictic. So th I have, that reference is right there for anyone who wants it later. And one last inter-annotator agreement. If you gave an annotator a, a, a gestural phrase, I go back and forth between phrase and phase because Kenan does it one way and other folks do it other way. So let's say phase. If you gave an annotator a gestural phase, the vast majority of the time they got it right. They, they agreed that it was a prep, a stroke, a retract, or a retraction. Okay. So retractions were great. They only got some confusion with preparations, but most of the time they, they were, uh, this is, Truth versus label. And preparations, um, sometimes strokes got labeled as preparations, but most of the time, preparations got labeled as preparations. Right? So humans can do this. Here's the fascinating part. Humans can do this. We, we can figure out preparation strokes and retractions exist. Or if, you, if I give you this theory of preparation stroke and retraction, and I give you a chunk of the, chunk of the data, you're, we're, we're all pretty good that we'll call it a stroke. Right? Then we should be able to get a signal out of it. And, and the long and the short of it is, this is how I did it all. We can skip all of this. The long and the short of it is, we only did OK. Right? We, did, we could pick out strokes a little bit better than chance. We can pick, and now, no, that was just for the, just for the stuff that I used. So, so I'm way over my five minutes. OK, so I'll stop then. We, we can pick out strokes a lot better. We can pick out strokes somewhat better than chance, but not, we didn't hit the ball out of the park. We didn't do 90%. We got like 70 or 80% of the time we could pick out strokes. Okay? But here's the question then. We, we then compared it to motion capture and said, OK, well, maybe our annotation scheme simply missed some of the physics that go into a stroke, simply missed some of the signal. So I got into a motion capture suit. I talked for a while. And then they did a form annotation of that video. So we had both form annotated and motion capture data. And motion capture data did significantly worse than human annotated data. 
Right? So you'd think that motion capture would do better. And the reason it did worse is actually pretty easy. Um, those I went to lunch with have already seen this example. If I stand here, this is actually a hold and a gesture, right? So if I, if I raise to do a prep and then I keep my hand there, that's a hold. But my hand's actually moving, right? My torso's swaying and I'm also swaying back and forth. Motion capture which captures that incidental movement. Your cognition smooths that to one point. In your mind, that hand hasn't moved, but in reality, it has moved, right? So the long and the short of it is there is something in the signal. My parameterization only captured some of it. But I think that the real way to do this is to have uh, add more data that, that humans annotate. Because we're very good at picking out the signal. We don't yet know what the parameters are. And going all the way down to physics gets us a worse result. OK. Sure, I did a lot of the analysis stuff here, too. And um, the, to be honest with you, I think that that's even a worse scheme than this. That was my first attempt. And so I did this work at Penn, and Norm Badler is really big into doing uh, LeBon movement analysis for this stuff. And given that he was on my committee, that was a request. Well, the internet interviews results aren't that good. And um, it's even coarser, right? The, the descriptions are even coarser. For those who haven't, well, I can show that later. I mean, and it's even harder to figure out what to say, in my opinion. So yeah, we did look at that. Um, and that's, that's a, a level that's, that's kind of at the beat level, but a little bit lower. It doesn't talk about the movement of the arms or the movement of the legs at a really low level. It says this kind of move happened with this, well, it depends on which one you do, with this kind of effort and this kind of shape. Right? And uh, that didn't work out so well. So. I have this question about your coding system. Um, from the way you presented the coding system, it wasn't clear to me whether when you do your analysis of the information that you coded about those gestures, are you analyzing static points in space, or is there a way that you can analyze your data so you can see, look at dynamic changes? Because That's the thing right. about strokes is it's not about where the it's arm lot, is, it's lot. about the change. Right. And so what you need to capture is the change in velocity, increase in velocity, velocity, ah. sudden deceleration, um, and that's what humans are doing. That's why we don't care about this little jiggle jiggle in the air. We care about the sudden movement that the hand is making. And then the hold, again, at the end of that. Absolutely. So uh, I will tell you what we did, and then the non computer scientists can just glaze their eyes. We used hidden Markov models. And hidden Markov models look at sequences of points. Okay? So we sampled at 30 frames per second, and then we used hidden Markov models to try to capture, to capture uh, sequential context. Right. It's, uh, the, a neural net equivalent might be an Elman net, which loops back. Even, even taking the patterns of change into account, still. Still, and I'll, I'll, say, say, something, I'll say something. So my was the following: We should look at change in first derivative. We should look at change in velocity and change and change, uh, excuse, change in location and change in velocity. So we, look, we should look at velocity and acceleration as well. And we did that. We captured deltas and delta deltas, which is the first and second derivative. Um, and it was worse. It was. It was just. It was worse. And we even tried curvature and torsion. Right? So we tried a bunch of geometric things. Wait, are you talking now on the human coded data or on your motion capture data? Both. So we took the human coded data, we converted the human coded data to locations. So um, I'm sorry, I had to skip it because of speed reasons. But uh, we, for this position, we made it relative to my, to my solar plexus, such that this was 333, three, three, this was 555, five, five, and this was 000. zero, zero right? And so we looked at, we did a lot of things. But we looked at change in that space. And we, all, we did uh, linear interpolation, we did cubic splines, we did a number of, well, we did, here, here's all of them. <laughs> and they don't capture the stroke. They, well, let's take a, let's take a quick look. Um, I could do, the best one for stroke, for, for capturing it, we're in question and answer period now, right, so it's okay. Um, There's a 90%. Well, let's just take a look at this one. Um, this had, uh, I used k means of 1,000, doesn't matter, and I used uh, cubic splines. Again, doesn't matter. It's just the way we did it. And I got an 80% preci precision. Well, what does that mean? That means it's pretty good, but the recall's terrible. That's why I said we didn't do so well. And that means of the things I called stroke, I was right 80% of the time. But mm, well, that's pretty good. That's very good. So I was very happy with that. And if we want to do some science where we say, I've got to find some strokes, then, then we can actually use this system. I actually got to 
uh, by throwing the kitchen sink at it. But I wasn't happy with that result. Right? But I think we could tweak it to get high precision. That means if I call it a stroke, we're sure it's a stroke. But I did terrible in recall. So in order to get 80% precision, I only got a 61% recall. That means that of all the strokes that are out there in the world, I only got 61% of them. So if my goal is to have a gestural interface to a machine, every stroke's going to be important. Right? It's good that when I call it a stroke, I'm right that it's a stroke. But if I miss 40% of those strokes, um, that's not the greatest. So it's, gonna, we can, we can, it's exactly like the facial expression, I mean, uh, uh, facial recognition software they did at that Logan Airport test right after 9-11. Right? If you could call everybody a terrorist, so uh, Guantanamo Bay is the model for that, right? <laughs> call everybody a terrorist, but you're guaranteed to get those terrorists that are in the population, right? Or call only people terrorists where you're absolutely sure, and if you're absolutely sure, you don't do very well, right? So it's, it's the same slider. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we could actually, at, at this lower level, um, pick out strokes which I still believe are going to be the most important part of the gesture and are going to have a lot of semantic meaning. Okay, stop. I got to stop, she said. <laughs> and I, I apologize if it was too computer science-y for the non-computer scientists in the room. Which I think is everybody, right? So you've changed the title of your talk? Yeah, I, I, I lied. <laughs> I, sorry. Actually, the, the truth of the matter is this. Um, I, when I first came along, I was going to give a poster presentation on ongoing research at MITRE. And then Sonny said, how about giving a half-hour talk? And I went, I don't have a half-hour talk about this, but I do have a half-hour talk about this. But I promise to make a dovetail. Um, so gestural phonology for gestural languages or why models matter. Please, next slide. All right. Um, the, the, the definition of gesture is actually one that is... Different models have different definitions for them, but generally it's a movement. Um, and, and the movement um, is, in, in, in the theories that I'm um, interested in, are related to some kind of task. It's either a concrete task or an abstract task, but it's a task uh, that you're trying to accomplish. Like saying the ch in chair, and then the things that you're doing with your diaphragm and with your glottis and with your tongue and with your chin are all gestures, right? Um, but in what I'm going to be talking about, I'm talking about visually perceptible gestures. You, say, you can perceive some of the gestures in saying the ch and chair, but it's not meant to be visually perceived. It's meant to produce an auditory effect. I'm talking about gestures that were meant to bring about an optical effect. Um, and I'm going to use the word meant really loosely. All right. Um, because many, many gestures, um, it's really hard to pin down the meaning. Ask anybody who works in gesture research, and you say, what does gesture X mean? And either you'll get different answers, or you'll get one of these deep philosophical, what is meaning anyway, kind of questions. And there's a good reason for that. Um, but these are the kinds of gestures I am talking about, like shoulder shrugs, um, emblematic gestures, right? And gestures used on the freeway, which are also emblematic but not used here. <laughs> Beats that we talked about, for example. Um, facial expressions. Um, body posture is a gesture uh, of, of, of sorts. Um, if you don't believe me, sit down in a mall and watch people. And watch just how they're walking. You know, you'll have one person walking like this, another person sort of. And this says a world about somebody. Um, proxemics. Um, one of the things that we're working on at MITRE right now is um, gestural systems as used in Middle Eastern cultures. Um, and proxemics is, is one of those vital issues. Um, Americans have a much larger personal space bubble than most Middle Eastern cultures that I know of. Um, if you're sitting on your own in a train in Cairo and the car is completely empty, an Arab will walk in the train and sit next to you because they can't stand being all the way out there all by themselves. <laughs> um, it's the way it is. And so with Americans and, and Iraqis, you see little, sort of this interesting dance going on as the guy sort of moves in on the person and the American backs away and backs away and backs away. You wonder how misunderstandings happen. 
Um, back channeling gestures, nodding, heading, you know, the sort of thing that you get all the time in conversations. Please, next slide. Now, here's another thing. I'm talking about a phonology of an optically gestural language. Now, we had other sort of terms floating around here like photology and so forth. Um, for me, phonology is simply a level of abstraction that talks about how things are articulated from some sort of internal representation to the way it is expressed in, in real time in the real world. Um, and so the phone in phonology is a red herring. You can have visual phonology. Please, next slide. Now, this is why I care. Um, one of the things I, uh, that I'm interested in is the issue of sign synthesis, of being able to provide some set of minimal information about a sign or a gesture and have that reproduced um, in a comfortable, reasonably accurate fashion. And this has many applications. Um, we have sign language dictionaries, for example, on, on CD-ROMs. Uh, and most, most of these dictionaries are, first of all, terrible. And second of all, um, they simply have recordings of people signing, which, in, which is a massive bandwidth. Um, you can't have one fraction of the information you need in a dictionary if all you have are videos for individual signs. You can't have example sentences. You can't have usage information. You can't do any of that stuff. Um, it also means um, if, we can, if we can represent essential information about a gesture or a sign at a, at a very compressed level based on sort of essential phonological information, that would um, answer one of the uh, um, requirements mentioned this morning of transmitting this information over low speed lines, uh, over low capacity lines, somewhere else where it can be reconstructed in all its glory. Um, also, there's the issue of being able to pro provide corpora for researchers um, while maintaining the anonymity of the sources. Um, it's relatively easy to maintain some kind of anonymity with voices on spoken language corpora. But for sign language corpora, you've got a face. There's nothing you can do about that <laughs> unless you find some way of providing an avatar. <laughs> right? And I mean that almost in the Hindu term, <laughs> right? an avatar for that person that does everything that person does. Right? Um, also, uh, one of the, one of the uh, interests at MITRE, and as, as well as in other departments across the defense establishment, is the use of serious games, uh, the use of simulations, World of Warcraft um, style simulations, um, for, for, for training and for, for battle sim. Um, and it also, uh, through synthesis, we also get things like you know, real visual interfaces, actual computer generated visual interfaces, as opposed to just recordings that uh, can give us a few canned responses. Next slide. More about the caring. Um, also, this applies to sign recognition, not a field of mine. But the more we can talk about the model, models of production of signs, the more I think we can talk about models of recognitions of signs and sort of important things to look for and what to store. Next. OK. Um, OK, what, what's going what's to follow now is I'm going to show you um, the elicitation of a gesture um, to, in, in, in the beginning of some of our work at MITRE. And I'm going to show so the animation of some of those gestures. And I'm going to point out a couple of things about the animation that I think are lacking and that I think um, a better model would be able to address. Um, pardon me. Mm -hmm. Now it's going to complain. Yes, open. There you are. OK. So this is a Middle Eastern gesture for slow down, be patient, take a chill. All right? OK, the, gest the gesture is generally this or this. And it, com and it usually accompanies any one of a number of utter utterances. But they mostly say things like, you know, not so fast. <laughs> right? 
right? And you were going to have another employee, Arab American employee, give the same gesture. Right. And now we're going to move this into the animation phase. Um, this is courtesy of our good people in the Bedford office. So he begins by a rough skeletal animation of the gesture, which he then is going to skin in just a second. Besides the creepy no pupils in his eyeballs <laughs> effect that's going on there, because this is a rough animation, um, there, there, there are several things to notice there. Um, one is there's almost this ghostly quality <laughs> to the guy's to the guy's gesturing, and he doesn't quite get his fingers together. That that isn't half bad. That can be solved. There's a, there's enough people working in humanoid animation um, that, that, that they've solved some of these problems, um, but. And, and they've even gotten pretty good with the kinematics so that, you know, your hand doesn't go through your head when you, when you try to do things. But what they, what they haven't figured out to, how to do very well is to get the motion to look realistic. There's something odd about it. And I think I know what the odd is. Let's, I'll, I'll hold you in suspense. And if you think you know the answer, write it down. Okay, so this is, this is a very well animated version of the same gesture. He'll do it again. You'll see this like three or four times at this point. But this is meticulously animated. Let's see this. For the love of Mike, slow down. I mean, you can see it on his face. These are used in training programs uh, for, for troops that are, that are heading out to the Middle East. Um, gestural competence is one of the areas that we are lacking in. Um, the slow down gesture, the come here gesture, um, this has gotten people killed. Um, simple things like you know, sort, of, sort of traffic gestures that you know, Marines were using at their old checkpoints that people had no idea how to use. You know, if you want to tell someone to stop, <laughs> you tell them to stop. You don't tell them to do whatever these things are because this means approach, right? And so the cab approaches, and the closer they get, the antsier the Marines get. And they only are allowed to get so antsy before they open fire, right? Um, you know, besides the stereotypical thing like showing your shoes to people and so forth, um, we teach people languages at the Defense Language Institute. But what we don't teach is cultural competence. They usually learn the language within a military environment in a military school surrounded by military people, um, by people who have been in the United States for the last 30 years. Um, then they head back to, to the country, um, and it takes, it takes you know, a lot of getting knocked about to get, get used to living within the culture and talking to people and, and looking not quite so alien. Um, so stuff like this is also will do a world of good for our language students. Um, and this is a piece of commercial software. You can actually download this off the internet. And it's a little rougher. Um, right now, very small. Um, work on Middle Eastern gesture was done in like the 70s by Barakat, way back when. Um, and then there was some, done, some work by Carol Sparhawk on Persian gestures, Iranian gestures, um, while she was out there living at the embassy or something like that. And um, the gestures are good, the Persian is lousy. Um, but not a whole lot of work has been done in the interim. Um, so the, the, one, of the, one of the projects at MITRE is to um, gather a, a reasonable database and make it available to the research community. Um, anyway, let's move on from here. Okay. So, um, the, again, you had the sort of almost spectral quality to the moving. What I thought was missing was a reasonable acceleration curve for these things. Um, and things like stress, one theory of stress in sign language, um, 
make stress in terms of peak, peak acceleration of the sign. Well, you can't have peak acceleration if you don't have acceleration. Um, if your velocity curve is flat, you're not, you're not going very far. Um, these are assumptions I'm making. Gestural movement is movement. Specifically, it's skilled movement. Right? A lot of it happens in, under the best of circumstances as without, without a whole lot of thinking. Uh, on the same level as you know, picking up a cup and putting it to your mouth. You don't have to think about it. And signers don't have to go, OK, I'm going to put this hand over here now, and I'm going to have to put this hand over here now. It's skilled movement. And for me, what separates language accompanying gesture from an actual language in the gestural medium is bandwidth. Right? We have um, a sort of a decent fund of experiments now for the last 10 years showing the more of the weight of a language you put on a gestural system, the more like a language behaves. You're making fun of my gestures, aren't you? <laughs> okay, all right. The more like a language it behaves. Um, now you got me self-conscious, and that's not right. Okay. <laughs> um, and that, you can think of that in sort of information theoretic terms, right? The more of an information load is carried by the signal, the more the signal has to worry, uh, the, or the user of the signal has to worry about exactly how um, all the information has to be conveyed. So road signs are relatively simple. I was talking um, about this during lunch. Road signs are relatively simple uh, because so much of the context is already provided. You're in a car or on a bicycle. You're on the road. You're moving in, 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 in a certain kind of direction. And so a lot of the context, is the, the number of things you can do is constrained. And so the, the signs only have to address the menu of options open to you, pass, not passing, the speed you're going at, applying brakes, inclines, declines, right? Um, but the minute you carry an awful lot of the information node, a load, as you do, say, in these quick point illustrations, the minute you start using it for unconstrained communication, you have to think about how you're going to talk about who did what to whom and when. And while they're doing that to them, what else is going on? Um, and you have to, perforce, either develop some sort of visual grammar or you have to import a grammar from your own language or from some other language. Um, so that's what I mean by that. I prefer theories that are more physical. Many of the theories that relate to the structure of sign language um, relate to abstract uh, mental categories um, derived from studies of spoken languages. And they're good. But I would say that, a, that, a, that one that works at the level of the machine and can predict at the level of the, of the human body machine is a better theory. Um, I prefer theories that are predictive that are falsifiable. If my theory doesn't work, I should be able to say, oh, scrap that, move on, and not say, oh, but I can move that into the lexicon and move it outside the scope of my theory and, and move on. Um, and I want it to be computable. In the words of one of my computer science professors, you know, who's talking about um, um, theories of, of sight perception uh, that, were termed, that, were, that were developed in Gestalt psychology. He says, those are great, but I can't compile them. I want theories that are compilable. Um, so, moving on. So, signs have parts. William Stokey, not the first guy to discover this, but the first guy in our century <laughs> to sort of work with this. Um, he figures out signs have parts, and he talks about hand shapes and locations and movements to, to be able to distinguish one sign from another as sort of diagnostic elements of the signs. Um, other uh, researchers, Liddell and Johnson and others later on, add pommend orientation and non-manual movement uh, components uh, to help distinguish one sign from another. So there, it's more of, a, more of an orthographic identification of the sign. It's not, it's not a real deep level of analysis. But it's deeper than taking a picture of a sign and saying that's what the sign is. Next. So. It couldn't describe the more complicated signs. It didn't have facilities for talking about two-handed signs or signs where, uh, or scenes where you have one hand and another, or changes in hand shape. Um, it also um, didn't account for complex phonological processes like reduction, um, um, segment epenthesis, adding of segments, um, re uh, eliminations that happen when, when two signs come together to form a blend, and so forth. Next. And so there were other phonological theories. 
um, loosely related to auto segmental theory. All right, so Liddell and Johnson um, talked about the elements of a particular hand shape and you know which hand, which fingers were active and which way it was facing and what kind of a it was and they so basically had like these uh, these sort of flat feature structures of components and they divided signs into holds movements and holds and they could talk about sort of complex signs that way next but it really didn't address this issue of acceleration curves for example you couldn't reproduce a sign looking as natural as possible it was still pretty bare boned um, and it was also difficult to apply to things outside the bounds of a sign language. It was very much linguistically oriented. Next. Okay, on to the theory. Articulatory phonology. Um, it's based on the idea of task dynamics. Task dynamics was, uh, sort of came out of a set of theories that were developed in the Soviet Union way back when. And then they sort of, so they made their way to the states, ooh, 70s, 80s. Um, Kelso, Elliot Saltzman at, uh, at Haskins Labs. Um, and they talked about using that to apply to skilled movement, um, taking a cup and putting it in your mouth, or um, uh, managing to reach out and grab something, and so forth. Um, and they really wanted to use that to talk about, uh, about, about skilled movement as opposed to kinematics, because kinematics didn't allow for, um, for in one way, kin kinematics was too specific. It talked about sort of movements of limbs and so forth. And in another, it didn't handle um, the dynamic as aspects of movement. Because, for example, if uh, someone perturbs the skilled movement, if someone blocks your movement or moves your arm, people can still accomplish the task. And that isn't allowed for in a, in a, in a theory of kinematics, where it is allowed for in a test dynamic model. And the way it does it is that by, by separating out these spaces, it has a task space, right? And the task space um, depends on a series of what they call tracked variables, particular apertures that have been narrowed down and selected that open and close to achieve the task. But those aren't, the, but those aren't that task space is not the body space, right? And that body space is actually not the articulator space. So between each of these spaces, you actually had to have a series of equations, translations, um, matrix transformations, essentially, between all of them. Um, but you started with the task space and you started with the tracked variables. Um, in human speech, it would be um, the distance between the two lips, the distance between the tongue and whatever surface it's near, uh, the opening and closing of the glottis. And for a lot of these, they found that a mass spring model provided the best model for natural movement, specifically a critically damped mass spring model. Right? That's a differential equation you can look up in any college <laughs> physics textbook. Huh? Critically damped mass spring model, right? Um, with the mass actually um, abstracted away, so the mass is always one, for example. And because it's critically damped, the, the, the damping ratio is always one. Um, so really what you would, the, the variables are your position, the stiffness of the spring, a couple of other things, right? Um, go ahead, let me move that up, move along. Um, and Elliot Saltzman wrote the equations that uh, applied the theory to human speech. And the theory is, was picked up by Broman and Goldstein um, at Haskins Lab, Yale, um, for their work. Um, it looks at these things as bundles of articulatory movements. So whenever I want to do something, there is a program, as it were. And we'll look at the program right now in terms of the task dynamics that says, you know, do this action. Open the glottis so much. Drop the tongue by so much. Open your lips at this point. Drop the, and based on those, it can actually go back, calculate the, the proper trajectories, and then st and go back and actually predict the model of how the mouth was to move down to the metal. It's not a perfect theory. It's still it's still in the researches in the research phase. They're still solving problems related to it, um, but it would go from the simplified re representation that I'll, I'll show you an example of that later to detailed thing, um, and these bundles of articulatory movements. Um, account for an awful lot of what we think of as linguistic change, um, the reduction of syllables and so on and so forth. I have seven minutes. That includes questioning? And then you can have some questions. Oh, excellent. I'm talking faster than I thought I was. Okay, with apologies to the interpreters. Um, so an example would be, um, 
a, this is some sign, right? And these are some tract variables. I don't have them worked out yet, quite frankly. Um, that's, that's part of my dissertation, um, which I will get to someday, and I, I forgive the skeptics <laughs> who know me in my dissertation timetable. <laughs> um, but this would represent, for example, like uh, the, the um, angle between a thumb and an index finger. And this might represent um, the angle between an elbow and a body. And this would be an arm body um, aperture. And this would be, um, and, and so on and so forth. There's, there's a, or this may be represented by a series of solid angles. Um, I'm not sure yet. Um, part of, part of the, doing this is doing the mathematical heavy lifting um, required to isolate the tract variables that Salzman did so well with speech but with gestural and sign systems, because there's so many more degrees of freedom, um, it becomes a you know, exponentially tougher problem. Next. So there are complications. One is this abstract mass problem. Um, if I have, uh, I'll give you an example from the sign language. Um, the sign for have to or must in American sign language, and in fact in a lot of European sign language, languages, is something like this. Um, <coughs> and notice what I'm doing here. I'm, 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 I'm actually doing the rotation from my arm, but it's my forearm which is lifting and dropping. All right? <coughs> but I can sign exactly the same thing using a phonetic process known as distalization by moving the entire movement out to my wrist. Now that makes a difference in the meaning of the sign. It changes the nature of the mustiness of the must. Okay, <laughs> um, and and when I when I when I when I'm moving it at the wrist, and I'm or whether I'm moving the entire forearm, the mass of what I'm moving changes. And the question is, is that always to be an abstract quality, or are there places where that makes a difference? I'm not sure yet. All right, and the same thing applies to, um, you know, referring to the tongue. If you're only using your tongue tip to touch something, that's different from having your entire tongue dorsum blocking the back of your throat. The mass of what's doing the work changes. <coughs> um, the other thing is that if, if this model generates more than one way to accomplish the task, are they all equally good? Or are there some other selection criteria? Will this have to work in tandem with other models and other theories to produce what it produces, what it needs to? I'm thinking of this in terms of being able to produce realistic looking acceleration curves and signs and in gestures so that the model looks more human. Um, and of course, the last thing I want to do is pick up my pet theory and say it solves everything. Um, I, 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 I have training as a theoretical linguist, so that's a danger. Um, but I work as a computational linguist, so I say whatever works. Um, next. All right, so the next steps for me, besides writing chapter three. Not chapter one. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> chapter one's easy. <laughs> um, it'll be this talk in some form or another. <coughs> um, the attempt to isolate a single tract variable. I think I'm going to start with one, start small, baby steps. Maybe something involving a big limb. Because um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with all these little fingers, right? Um, and I'll test it against a couple of problems. Perhaps, perhaps the problem of uh, producing sign blends, um, and then I'll hopefully be able to show some progress by Vale 2008. You know, maybe some better animation. <laughs> and with that, I'm done. Are there any questions?